All right. How's it going so far? Come on. Um, watch your back browser. You're being observed. Um, we have the quick intro right now. So I'm Stefan from Berlin, front-end developer. Um, occasional teaching, CSS and Node. And I'm running the Web Performance Meetup in Berlin. And my main focus these days is open source, web performance, and web accessibility. Oops. Sorry. And I work for Contentful. So we are basically a content management system in the cloud. So when you're building a single page app and you want to give some non-technical people something to edit content, you can use Contentful and then you just have an API, which you work with anyways. So we always say with Contentful, editors get a CMS and developers actually don't have to work with one. And the last fact about myself is that I'm really excited about conferences. And I think we all are, because we're all here, right? Because you can learn so much stuff. You can meet so many new people. You can make new friends. And you can have an excellent time. And these events just simply help me to stay up to date. Because we all have to admit it, the web platform evolves really fast these days. We've got yearly ECMAS group releases, finally. New APIs, browser APIs are coming up every day. And we finally have evergreen browsers. So, Staying up to date is more or less part of our job. And I personally have a hate-love relationship with this. Because on a daily basis, and I love it, and it's also really exhausting, we are dealing with this. A new tool every week. But at the same time, it gets better and better. Because browser APIs adapt to common use cases. Think of jQuery. Years ago, we had the dollar selector. Now we have document query selector all. And we're slowly moving from a pull model where we have to ask for information to a push model. And I thought we should celebrate that. Because we've got a lot of new cool stuff. So what I did is I took the website of OJS. That's the schedule. And I think we can have a little bit more celebration in here. So let's spice it up a little bit. And what I added is a lazy loading effect. In case you don't know this one, that's the Twitter heart animation. And Anna Tudor, who um, does really impressive, impressive stuff with CSS, does this with a single element. So how would you achieve this usually? First thing, OK, how do I figure out if something is visible in the viewport? How, do, how did I do that for years? Googling, right? What you find then is that. Who is guilty of copying this snippet? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're calling element get bounding client rect, and then there's some logic where I always was too lazy to think of it because it works. And there's one problem with that, though. Element bounding client rect can trigger um, the browser to synchronously calculate style and lay layout when something changed. So when you use this function, Please do all the reads first, and then do all the writes. But this is actually pulling for information, right? I'm, I don't think we want to do that. If you're interested what functions you can use on, on DOM elements, Paul Irish is maintaining this document. So have a read there. So now we've got this function. What's the next step? Defining a scroll handler, right? So I'm grabbing all the people, and then I'm attaching it to scroll. And then I'm adding this class, party, party. And then I'm done, and then I'm removing the element from the uh, elements to be watched. The thing is, scroll handlers are really expensive. And you should throttle them anyways when you use them. <coughs> because what we want to achieve for, for building good and fluent user interfaces is this. 60 frames per second. So one second divided by 60 is 16 milliseconds. To avoid janky scrolling, to have this interface that is butter smooth sticking below my finger when I'm using my phone. But this is actually not true because, well, the browser has actually to do, to, uh, do more work than executing my stuff. So in reality, we have maybe around 10 milliseconds to do our JavaScript stuff. We want to do as less as possible in a scroll handler. So I monitored my initial implementation. And I throttled, my, the, uh, throttled the CPU on Chrome DevTools because this is a MacBook Pro, heavily expensive, really new. That's not your average user. And that's not your average phone. So 
and what I discovered then is that my um, lazy load animation was running on 31 frames per second. And when I digged a little bit deeper, what is the reason for that? Well, you see this big yellow block there, get bounding client wrecked. Hmm. Can we do better? I think we can. So there's the intersection observer, fairly new. And this is a method to asynchronously query the position of an element with respect to other elements or the global viewport. With something like that, we can avoid costly DOM and style queries. We don't have to pull for information. And we can reduce the CPU, GPU, and energy costs of our applications to figure out if something is visible. So how does that work? This is an intersection observer implementation. So I have to define some options. There's a threshold value, and I'm defining 1.0 here, which means that I want to be notified when the whole element is visible. Then I'm initializing a new intersection observer. And then I've got some entries. And then, then there's this intersecting property, which tells me if the element is intersecting the current viewport. And if this is done, because I don't want to do this several times, I'm unobserving the thing. And then I'm just grabbing all the elements I want to watch out for, and I'm calling observe. I think that's pretty cool. So I monitor it again, and you see no bounding client dragged, and no additional work to figure out if something is visible. And at the end, I ended up with 59 frames per second. This is what people on a phone will really like. So when you're building user interfaces, what I want to tell you is just have a quick look at these kind of things. The dev tools today are extremely powerful. So what options do we have? We can define a different root element. We can give some information about this, uh, how this root element is laid out. And then we've got this threshold value, which accepts a single value or an array of values. So let's have a quick look at this one. So when we define several values here, um, 0 and 1, this will actually fire when the element enters the viewport, when it's completely visible, when it starts leaving the viewport, and when it's gone. And this is just a few lines of JavaScript. I really love that. So playing around with the intersection observer, let's have a look. So when we define a threshold of 0, what do we got? When it's entering the viewport, we've got is intersecting true, and an intersection ratio that is something around 0. Why something? Because it's asynchronous. The browser decides um, when it has time to figure out if something is visible. And when it's then leaving the viewport, we've got is intersecting false. And the intersection ratio is 0, because, well, it cannot go below 0 here. There was one thing, though, that surprised me. When we have a value that is bigger than 0, like, let's say, 0 0.5, we've got is intersecting true and something around 0 0.5, right? But when it's now leaving the viewport again, we've got, whoops, sorry, uh, leaving. We've got is intersecting still true. In my head, it was kind of, I was expecting false here. But when you think of that, this makes sense, because the element is still um, intersecting viewport when it hits this threshold. And the ratio then is something around 0 0.5. And when you think of that, with the intersection observer, interfaces like that are really easy to do. And when you discover that, so there's a play button appears when something disappears. This is 10 lines of JavaScript. We can do a lot of cool things with this. We can also use it for responsive web design or kind of things, because the intersection observer will tell us when something is visible or not, or when it becomes visible or not. This is pretty cool stuff. So what is the support today for the intersection observer? Edge, yes. Chrome, yes. Firefox, yes. Safari, at least in development. Opera, yes. But when you play around with the intersection observer, Watch out. There are right now incompatibilities between the specs and implementation of different vendors. It's a little bit, yeah. There are two, um, two issues there. Um, Microsoft and Chrome are collaborating on how to reach a final state. Um, but is this usable in production? Yep. There's an official polyfill provided by the WICG. And they're also dealing with this on com incompatibilities. Cool. So what we did so far is we celebrated each talk separately. But I think we can do more here. Let's celebrate the whole schedule. So 
I took a moment again and I changed the schedule. <laughs> so how do I do that now? I've got this intersection observer implementation, and this is wrapped in an immediately invoked function expression, so I have no clue when the class party party is added. Hmm. What I can do is I can use a mutation observer, right? The mutation observer provides developers with a way to react to changes in the DOM. And this is what's happening, right? A class is added. So how's this working? So we grab the whole schedule. We are fig figuring out how many talks are in there. Then we're defining a config to tell the mutation observer, yeah, I want to watch out for attributes. And yeah, I want to watch the whole subtree. Then I'm counting the talks that has, have been seen already. I'm creating a new mutation observer. And I'm just counting up if a new element has been mutated and has now the class party party. And then if talk seen equals number of talks, I'm calling a third party method, which is cornify um, add. And then I'm disconnecting, disconnecting again. And then I'm just observing the schedule. Cool. So what options do we have? We can define if we want to watch out for um, direct children, for attributes, or whole subtrees. What's the support for the mutation observer today? Pretty green. Didn't expect that when I checked that for the first time. But what I did now is I implemented a third party method, right? Which also does some fancy unicorn stuff. What I also want to tell you is let's always watch out for performance when we're doing these kind of things. And talking about performance, there are two ways to measure performance. There's synthetic monitoring and there's real user monitoring. Synthetic monitoring is actually that you tell a robot, whatever the robot is, to go to your website and get some metrics. And real user monitoring is actually that your users um, will execute a JavaScript snippet, which you then send back to a monitoring service of your choice. So the most common synthetic monitoring service today is web page test. Um, in case you haven't seen web page test yet. This is web page test. You can enter a URL. You can define from where um, this robot should visit your site. You can define a connection speed. And then you get a lot of metrics that can help you to improve your website performance. So in this case, just to show you a quick result here. So you got waterfalls, tips and tricks, um, and usually really useful metrics. If you need more and you want to monitor constantly performance, there are also services out there that are called maybe Speedcurve and Calibre, which help you to monitor the performance of your website constantly. Highly recommended. But what I want to actually talk about are the real user monitoring metrics. So what we have today is the navigation timing API, the resource timing API, and the uh, user timing API. So let's have a quick look here. The navigation timing API is an interface for web application to access the complete timing information for a navigation of a document. And it's available at window.performance.timing. And what we can access here is something like that. These are really detailed timestamps on what happened on the initial HTML connection. This goes from DNS to TCP to even DOM content load. I think this is really useful stuff. Then we've got the resource timing API which we can use with window.performance get entries by type resource. And this is an interface for web applications to access the complete timing for resources in the document. And we get the same information, almost the same information. And looking at this, think of render blocking resources, right? If your style sheet is hanging around for some users, you want to know that. The resource timing API is the perfect tool for that, to get notified when something happens. And then we've got the user timing API. So this was the, which is an, uh, um, an API to create application-specific timestamps that are then part of the browser's performance timeline. So this was the initial unicorn implementation. And to figure out how long it takes, I can set marks. So I have um, quantified start and quantified end there. And then I can define a measure to figure out how long this execution takes. And I can then access this information by using get entries by type mark. And these are the marks I set before and after. And I get the measure with get uh, by type measure. And we see there, OK, the unicorn's execution took six milliseconds, which 
kind of fits into my 10 milliseconds budget. So talking about um, RAM metrics, what we have is we have mark measures, navigation, and resource. And these are accessible via get entries, get entries by type, and get entries by name. But this is not what we want. I believe that, at least. Because with this, we're polling for information. We have to ask, hey, are new metrics there? Hmm? And we maybe have to implement duplication to figure out, OK, have I seen this metric already? Yes, no, is it in there? Yes, no. Hmm? What we can use here is, well, you might guess, a performance observer. So the implementation is similar to the others. So you can initialize a new performance observer. Then you get a few entries. And I'm just logging here. I'm not pinging them back to a monitoring service. And I'm measuring for type measure here. And this words, I can put this snippet into my head of the document. And I just have to wait. And this is really comfortable. When you read the spec about the performance timeline and the performance observer, there's written that the developer is encouraged to use the performance observer where possible. I, I can deal with that. But then there is a second sentence which tells us, further, new performance APIs and metrics may only be available through the performance observer interface. Hmm. What metrics are we talking about here? So there's paint timing, which is already shipping in Chrome 60. So it tells us when the first pixel was rendered and also when the first contentful paint happened. A contentful paint is any text image, non-white canvas, or SVG. And then we're all doing well, single page applications, right? We're throwing a lot of JavaScript to our users. Then there's also the long task metric, which is supported since Chrome 58. And this tells us when a JavaScript operation takes longer than 50 milliseconds. So with these metrics at hand, for example, what I do in my personal website is that I just have a, a flag that I can toggle. And I've got this information right at my fingertips. And I'm also relying on, an, on the Contentful API here. So I have always the timings right in front of me for the stuff I really care about. Also, things like when you do your um, custom metrics, for example, let's have a look at Zalando here. What is the most important thing here? I would say this image that takes this much space is the most important thing. Maybe it is important for you to know when this was laid out, right? Because you're giving it so much space. For example, Twitter is constantly monitoring how much time it takes for the users to see the first tweet that is in their timeline. How do you figure out if this thing was loaded? Well, right now, we have to do something like that. So you have to define an onload handler, then clear the marks for a given key, and set the new mark. And after that, an inline script element that does the same. So what basically happens is whatever runs last is the correct value here. That's, that's not good developer experience, I would say. <coughs> Um, what is currently in the spec making is the spec making is the hero element timing API. So hopefully at some point we can do something like that, and we can ask the browser, "Hey, please tell me when this element is laid out and rendered." I'm really looking forward to that one, but this is currently only in spec making. And just for the sake of completion, we also have server timing metrics. Fiddling around with headers and stuff is always really inconvenient, but with the server timing metric, metric we can, the server can set the server timing headers, and these will magically appear in the performance observer. This is also cutting edge, but it works in Chrome Canary already. So if you're interested in metrics and web performance, there was an excellent talk um, on Google I.O., which was called Leveraging the Metrics that Most Affects User Experience. Highly recommended. <laughs> What's the browser support today? Safari joined the party. I discovered that yesterday, actually, which is OK. So Edge, as for all the stuff I look at, is under consideration. Uh, it's in Firefox Beta 2. Is this polyfillable? Right now, a few things 
are also um, available via get entries by type, for example, the paint timing and the long tasks. You can ask for this information. But when browser vendors at some point decide to push Metrix only to the performance observer, well, then the journey is more or less over, right? So unicorns are pretty great, but what's better than unicorns? Onesies. Onesies, yeah. Laser unicorns, I give you a hint. This is my favorite stock image of all times, for it, by the way. I'm from Berlin, I love electronic music and sunshine. That's the perfect day. So what is it? I, close, I say confetti. And to, to bring this in, um, I had to cheat a little bit, and I implemented a slide down effect into the schedule. So this is what I came up with. <laughs> that makes me really happy. <laughs> so let's play, play the same scenario again. This was implemented with some JavaScript that is hanging around somewhere. I have no clue how to figure out when something is opened. How can I detect that? <laughs> well, there is another observer for that, the resize observer. So how can we use the resize observer? Um, same pattern as before. Um, initialize the resize conserver, uh, observer, and then I get entries, and then I'm just drawing confetti. <laughs> and yeah, then I'm just observing all the elements. So you might ask yourself, yeah, when is this thing firing? So it fires when an element is inserted or removed from the DOM. It's firing when an element gets uh, set to display block or none. It's not triggering um, on CSS transforms, which is interesting. So it is called initially. And you might, might have discovered that now that, well, actually, my implementation was broken. So it draws confetti on on load, it draws on closing, and it also draws on resizing the window horizontally. But I think, so, wait a second, but I think it, it was good enough. So when do we, could we use a resize observer? Well, for drag and drop interfaces, right? When you want to adjust something that is draggable in your interface, then this is handy. And this is six lines of JavaScript. And we're all waiting for element queries, right? Um, the JavaScript libraries that um, make it possible to use element queries today are all considering to switch to resize observers at some point. So what's the support today? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're entering cutting edge here. Polyfillable? I would say so-so. There are polyfills out there. They use mutation observers to figure out if something changes um, its size. but well, these are then kind of costly operations, so I would really consider if you want to um, use a resource observer with a polyfill. So maybe we want to tackle the broken implementation of the confetti. So let's step back a little bit. What, what I have, and this is a simplified version for one element here. I've got the initial call. I've got several opening calls. And I've got several closing calls. And what I want to get rid of is, well, the first one and the closing ones. How could I do that? Here we've got the callback that draws the confetti. How can I get rid of the first one? Well, storing a Boolean and toggling that, maybe. And how can I figure out if it's increasing in, in height? Well, storing the last one and then comparing this. This is, I think, not really readable, and this is really not maintainable, and it has side effects outside of the event handler, which is something I usually try to avoid. So let's enter observables. Um, when you're thinking of an array, an array is a sequence in memory, and an observable is an array over time. Their observables are currently only in spec, and they are on ECMAScript spec stage one, and definitely, they are a talk on its own. But to fit the title of the talk, I had to bring them in. So observables are a collection that arrives over time. So let's have a look at an example implementation here. 
So what you can do is I implemented a function that is called get observable with three values. This creates a new observable, and then it's using next to push three values, and then at some point it says it's done. Next step is to define the handlers for the next, for the complete, and if an error appears. And then we can just call get observable with three values, subscribe, and then we got next, one, two, three, and we are done. When I saw this for the first time, I was like, what's the deal? That's just shifting callbacks around, right? But now we're dealing with a collection, which means that we can do stuff like map, filter, and reduce. And this makes it possible to write way, way cleaner code. So let's have a look at my resize observer implementation. So it was something like that. And I flipped that to use Rx here. And instead of new observable, I'm calling observable create using Rx. And now I'm dealing with a collection of events over time. And this gives me collection superpowers. So let's have a look how I can deal with the events now. So this is what we have. And here we've got the function get resize stream. How can I get rid of the first one? Well, skip it. Cool. How can I get, can get, how can I get the previous call? There's a function that is called pairwise. So now I have got the current and the previous one, the current and the previous one. How can I now compare if it's opening or closing? Well, I can use filter. That's cool. And then I can map it back. Nice. And then I can perform the operation I want to do. This is pure functional code without side effects. This is easy to read, maintainable, and testable. I really like that. So with that, my implementation looked like that. You might argue if more confetti would be better, but yeah. <laughs> so what we talked about was the intersection observer to easily figure out if something becomes or le visible or leaves the viewport, the mutation observer to figure out if something changed in the DOM, the performance observer to not ask for, for, for performance metric, but rather get notified and get uh, metrics pushed towards us, the resize observer to figure out if something changes its size and observables, which are a completely different way of thinking, and it takes a while to, to get it. So I'm working in the web dev industry for seven years now. And oh well, so much has changed. But I th still think that web development is a big love in my life, probably. But yeah, it's still fun. And we, have all, we all know that so much will still change. And even if it is exhausting, I really love that. And we're all here, and we will have two excellent, time, uh, two excellent days. And what I want to do now is to celebrate good times. So are you ready? And that's it. Thank you.